Holocaust. The enormity of the crime is staggering. Six million Jews murdered. One out of every three Jews on earth. The slaughter was systemized, mechanized, automated, and relentless. From trains to gas chambers to crematoria. On our program, you'll hear the eyewitness story of a man who faced seven years of slavery and torture. Determined to survive to tell the world what had happened to his family and his people. His harrowing story is one you'll not soon forget. I want to thank you for joining me today on Focus on Israel. I'm Laurie Cardoza Moore, founder and president of Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, a nonprofit organization dedicated to educating and sharing the message of Christian biblical responsibility to the people and land of Israel in the face of a growing global anti-Semitism. In 2005, I founded Proclaiming Justice to the Nations to stop the silence, to wake up Christians and people of conscience to the realities of a world bent on destroying Israel and the Jewish people. From the start, PJTN has had a proven track record of fighting for the rights of Israel and the Jewish people, a record of standing firm in the face of overwhelming odds against a world of Jew and Israel hatred, a record of not compromising on the very plan of God. Today, who would have believed that within a generation from the untold suffering of the Holocaust, the Jewish people would once again be the subject of such an intensely growing global wave of hatred and violence. This in the face of a new generation of Holocaust deniers and young people who perpetrate persecution and anti-Semitism on college campuses around the U.S. and are translating that hatred into violence against Jews on streets all across Europe. In our lifetime, we are seeing the growth of intense hatred from the same poisonous seeds from which the Holocaust grew. Can we truly say never again? On our program today, we'll hear the life story of Holocaust survivor Al Katz. Like the few who lived through the horrors of the Holocaust, his story is both ghastly and inspiring, a true miracle of survival by God's hand. Mr. Katz was born in 1920 in Paderborn, Germany, during a very turbulent time in European history. Two years before, in 1918, Germany had surrendered in the war to end all wars, World War I. And just one year later, Adolf Hitler made his earliest known recorded statement about the Jews in a letter to Adolf Gimlich about the Jewish question. In the letter, Hitler argues that the aim of the government must unshakably be the removal of the Jews altogether. During his childhood, Al Katz experienced the dramatic rise in European anti-Semitism until that fateful day in November. On November 9th of 1938, at the age of 18, he witnessed the horrific beginning of the Holocaust on Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. On that night, he narrowly escaped as his father was taken and imprisoned in the Buchenwald concentration camp. It wasn't long before Al was captured, then deported and spent the next seven years in slavery, in ghettos and camps from Germany to Latvia. Shortly after he and his family were deported to the Riga ghetto, his parents and little brother were murdered in a nearby forest where Jews were shot in masses and buried in pits they unwittingly dug for their own graves. Several years later, his extended family, uncles, aunts, cousins, and grandparents were also found to have been murdered by the Nazis. In May of 1945, Katz escaped a death march to make it to the front lines and was liberated by the American forces. That next year, he immigrated to the U.S. and became a proud U.S. citizen. Mr. Katz survived the Holocaust only to again experience the horrors of imprisonment and torture in the final year of his life. The Manatee County Public Guardian's abuse of him reminded him of Nazi cruelty and sadism. 
In 2009, the 89-year-old Katz was kept in locked units and denied companionship of his family and friends and decent medical care. Retreating into horrific memories, Katz believed he was once again a prisoner of the Nazis and subject to their torture. In just two months of guardianship, he nearly died. Through a divine miracle, his daughter was allowed to take him home and care for him for the last eight months of his life. Fortunately for us, before his death in 2010, Mr. Katz recounted much of his life experiences in his memoir titled, Outrage. Up next, you'll hear excerpts from this captivating book, the story told in his own words. From 1938 till 1945, seven brutal years, I was a slave. On the night of November 9th, 1938, I saw my synagogue burn to the ground. I saw them throw out the prayer books and put a match to them. They smashed the windows of the Jewish stores and took everything out of the showcases. The Nazis didn't even know I was there. I didn't look any different than the rest of them. That night they took my father. My father, Louis Katz, a, a German World War I hero who had earned the Iron Cross, was one of 334 Jewish men from Hanover arrested and sent with tens of thousands more to Buchenwald concentration camp. The Nazis came to the door and arrested him. I saw it happen. I went through the back window to escape into the woods until late at night. When my father came back from Buchenwald, he went to Hamburg, to the American consulate. The consuls were advised to make it difficult for Jews to get out of the country. Not by the Germans, but by the U.S. government. My father said, I couldn't see the consulate. An SS trooper is his bodyguard. I couldn't go past him. He wouldn't let me see him. And my father was in tears. It was the first time I'd seen that. When mass murders, 30,000 imprisonments of innocent men in a day, and massive destruction of thousands of Jewish properties openly, publicly, proudly, was committed by the Nazis. <laughs> the world was being tested by the Nazis on Kristallnacht, and the world failed. Thus was birthed the Holocaust, the unique, systematic, mechanized genocide of the Jewish people. Six million Jews' lives removed from the earth, and countless millions barely escaped the unmarked graves of their family members and nameless ashes from the crematoria. I, Al Katz, survived by the hand of God. On December 15th, 1941, my family and I were rounded up and deported from Hanover, Germany, in the depth of winter, with only the clothes on our backs. We had no idea that we would be deported from Germany. We were put on the train and that's all. You had no idea where you were going. As the train kept going. Three days and 850 miles later across Germany and Latvia, we arrived at Riga, Latvia, the coldest Nazi ghetto on earth, the farthest north concentration camp, almost Siberia, 52 degrees below zero. It would turn out to be a most fateful move for my family. The area also included the Kasserwald concentration camp, the Riga ghetto, the Salaspils concentration camp, and an infamous killing site, the Rumbola Forest. Deep in the depths and darkness of the Rumbola Forest, Jews were shot in masses, buried in pits they unwittingly dug for their own graves. They are likely lie the bodies of my adored mother, father, and my, and my precious little brother, Arthur Werner Katz. They lived, they died, they suffered. Their exact place of death will never be known. 
Thus my family was eliminated from Earth with no gravestones for me to visit. I always knew that I was going to survive. Somebody had to survive for my family. I was the only one who really had a chance to. I always kept my faith. I'm, I'm proud to be a Jew. I always said there's somebody up there bigger than a Hitler, and he will get us through. I still believe in God. I cannot understand how people who went through what we went through don't believe in God. If there wouldn't have been a God, none of us would be alive. When I walked to work every day, I prayed with my own words, and I think that's what helped me get through. The prayer, Shema, that means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He was ever with me, and saved me again and again. I had many cousins, uncles, and aunts. None of them survived. But I did. I and many others all shared the same fates and the same faiths. Being cheated out of our lives, robbed of our families, and fervently believing that somehow, somehow we must survive to tell the world what had happened to us, our families, our people. In May 1945, after seven years of Nazi slavery, I was on a final death march from Dachau concentration camp when American airplanes appeared at treetop level. I ran away from death's door to the American lines and was liberated by Mickey Cohen, a Jewish tank operator fighting the Nazis. It was a miracle to be liberated, a divine miracle. I had escaped that death march by the hand of God. I left Germany for America in 1946, and the next year I met my wife, Sophie, who bore me two wonderful children. I lived again, again. Still many nights I remember too much. For thirty years my wife, my, my Sophie, comforted my soul, holding my misery in her gentle hands, soothing my memories and praying for me. I lost my mother. I lost my father. I cry and cry. I lost my little brother, my Arthur Werner, and no tears can equal my pain. I still see his little hands shoving his paltry food ration into my hands through the ghetto fence. Dear Arthur, your sacrifice never leaves my soul. You fed me when you were starving and freezing. You fed me. In 1946, after his liberation, Al Katz left Germany to become an American citizen and a year later, he fell in love and married Sophie Passo. Together they raised two children, a loving son and daughter. He spent many years teaching others about what he'd experienced and warning that it could happen again. He spoke out, saying that vigilance must never stop to prevent another Holocaust. As fate would have it, he lost his loving wife Sophie in 1977. Her death left him with the hole in his life he would never fill. Fate would frown on him again in September of 2009 when outrageous lies forced him into the appalling guardianship program as a ward of the state. Lies such as he had no one to care for him. The probate court thus appointed professional guardians who had total power over him and his assets. In reality, the primary focus of professional guardianship is asset seizure, leaving wards of the state bereft of property and possessions. According to the United States Congress, the typical ward has fewer rights than the typical convicted felon, and guardianship is the most severe form of civil deprivation which can be imposed on a citizen of the United States. Lower in status than a murderer, a ward is a slave, a person without rights, without control of his life, without warning, forced to live most often in nursing homes while the state takes and consumes his assets. At age 89, his court-appointed guardians transferred him to a lockdown in Casa Mora nursing home behind huge metal electronic doors, surrounded by men in uniforms, much like the camps that haunted his memories. 
There he was strapped into a hospital bed, pinned down and injected with drugs that sent him into flashbacks of his Nazi slavery. Cold and scared, he went back 70 years, back again to relive the nightmare. He spent six weeks of two successive lockdowns under conditions beyond those imposed upon dangerous felons and deprived of civil rights, even possessed by criminals. In just two months of professional guardianship through severe medical neglect, Mr. Katz was at the point of near death. Only after three days of burning fever did the nursing home finally call the hospital to pick up his lifeless body. His daughter Beverly came and stayed with him, crying at his side, hours and days, until Judge Logan released him to go home. In a delirium from fever, he could no longer walk, eat, or talk. For the most part, he was dead. It was November 16, 2009, when his professional guardians ordered his pickup from Blake Hospital. He was designated as imminent death. They had already arranged for his funeral and burial without even telling his daughter. But the Almighty himself made other arrangements and his imminent death was delayed by a judge greater than any court on earth. It had been designed by the court for Mr. Katz to never return home but it was not God's design. Somehow the divine power kept him alive again and brought him home once more to live and to die with his family in peace, a freed man. In an article in Tablet Magazine titled Guardians from Hell, his case is still being used as a model of guardianship abuse. Al Katz barely escaped numerous Nazi camps, including Dachau, only to become the ward of guardians in Florida at the age of 89, repeatedly being hospitalized and institutionalized under the control of his guardians until he was nearly dead in just two months' time. On June 6, 2011, nearly one year after the passing of Al Katz, the Sarasota City Commission acknowledged his suffering under guardianship by demonstrating its unanimous support for the Al Katz campaign to save Jewish Holocaust survivors from institutionalization. It stated that he was placed into multiple institutions in 2009 under court-ordered guardianship against his will, resulting in dire distress to him and causing his health to decline precipitously. The city of Sarasota declared that all due diligence should be exercised to keep survivors in their own homes or in the homes of willing family members to the betterment of our society by preserving the dignity of our honored elders. Even after his death, his family's inheritance has been consumed and wasted first through the unlawful guardianship in Manatee County, Florida, and then through a probate case in Indianapolis, Indiana. Judge James Joven's protracted proceedings have dragged on for a decade, robbing Mr. Katz's family of all his worldly inheritance. The story of Al Katz is truly an outrage, as is the story of the six million who were murdered and the others that miraculously survived. Today, around the world, Holocaust survivors are once again abandoned, just as they were in Nazi Europe. Close to half who survived unfathomable suffering now live beneath the poverty level. These are people who have seen the worst, who were in ghettos and concentration camps, who made it through Auschwitz and death marches, but now can't afford medical treatments, nursing care, and even food. There is not much time left. As Mr. Katz stated, our extinction doesn't matter, individual or collective. That is how we feel, abandoned again and again. Unfortunately, it just never ends. It's never completely safe for Jews. It's generational in America and the world. Generational acquired Jew hatred passed through the generations across time and across the world.
from person to person, place to place, and millennium to millennium. From classroom to classroom, neighborhood to neighborhood, community to community. The hatred wanes and waits, then lunges and pounces atop a single Jew or one Jewish family, awaiting community response. When there is none or lonely whispers of objection, the Jew hatred grows, feeding on itself and any opening for unchecked growth in the community, state, and nation. Then it consumes innocent victims with classic anti-Semitic accusations, filthy names, putrid jokes, relentless ridicule, official restrictions on Jewish rituals and practices, communal ostracism and palpable rejection, vandalism on Jewish property, interpersonal violence, irreparable bodily injuries, deaths, mass murders, and ultimately industrialized genocide. This is generational genocide learned at times while in the womb or the home or the classroom or the church or the media or meetings learned and rehearsed through richly funded propaganda campaigns against Jews and Israel, learned to the detriment of society. As in the days before the Holocaust throughout the world, Jews are once again unsafe on the streets and in their homes and businesses in Europe and the United States. Virtually every Jewish institution in Europe is secured by heavily armed guards, walls, fences, and 24-hour surveillance. In America, all Jewish communal facilities are strongly advised to implement safety measures, including locked doors, armed guards, and heavy, round-the-clock electronic surveillance. Mr. Katz once asked, what have we learned in 75 years? That lies can be bigger than life? and believed by multitudes and masses forsaking the truth for the sake of hatred? This is the inescapable truth of the Holocaust, surpassed by the truth that God gives man free will choices to choose him and his ways above all else. Thankfully, Mr. Katz's passing was peaceful. On July 11, 2010, he left this world and was buried in Indianapolis beside his beautiful Sophie. After 33 years, they were together again. Sadly, the nightmarish flashbacks did not end until the final months of his life. In his memoir, he wrote, I still hear the voices, see the faces, the uniforms, the seething dogs trained to kill Jews, the weapons, whips made of wood and leather, bullets blowing off heads, machine guns, truncheons beating us. I can never forget. I hear, I see, I always remember. Relive, relive, relive. The slavery, confinement, cold, bitter weather with bare body parts, exposed to crashing winds, craved minds, coarseness, unbelievable cruelty. I cannot forget that human beings, precious, irreplaceable, were sacrificed by the millions and millions, murdered mercilessly for the sake of ideology turned to evil theology. Worshiping a monstrous man, worshiping the power to murder a baby or a grandmother, worshiping and relishing the power to turn mass murder into an industry. In remembrance of Al, a Jewish cultural center was founded in Bradenton, Florida. The Al Katz Center for Holocaust Survivors and Jewish Education. Unfortunately, the COVID crisis caused a loss in visitors and in revenue and has left the center without a physical location. The center still offers over 175 community programs each year, and the website is a wealth of information, videos, and other items. If you'd be interested in providing a new location for the center in the South Florida area, 
please send an email to helpelders at hotmail.com. Outrage, the book on the life and times of Holocaust survivor Al Katz, will soon be available. To get on the waiting list for this compelling and informative work, you can send your request to helpelders at hotmail.com. Well, that's our program for today. And I want you to know we appreciate your support. The time to take a stand is now. Be a leader in your community and in your church. One person can make a difference. Get involved with and support pro-Israel organizations such as PJTN. Call your senators, congressmen. Let your elected leaders hear from you. Visit our website to learn more. Sign up to receive action alerts and order our films to share with family and friends. Please encourage everyone you know to tune in and become informed. God bless you and thank you for all you do on behalf of our Jewish brethren and all Israel. We'll see you next time on Focus on Israel. To support this program, send your tax-deductible gift to Proclaiming Justice to the Nations, P.O. Box 682711, Franklin, Tennessee, 37068. You can also support PJTN online. Visit PJTN.org or call 1-877-873-9020. Anti-Semitism has reached epic proportions, and Israel is now surrounded by nations who seek its destruction. For Israel to lose just one battle would mean losing everything. As Christians, it is our biblical responsibility to stand with our Jewish brethren and Israel. PJTN needs your help to reach more Christians with this urgent message. Please visit our website to become a member today and order our award-winning documentaries. You must decide that you won't be silent. Sign up now at PJTN.org. God bless you and thank you for your support and prayers. Thank you.